I suppose uh, this is the part where we, we do the uh, the introductions and, and we will get to, to the speaker very shortly. So I hope you'll just bear with us uh, for a moment. So please let me, first of all, introduce myself. My name is Will Galloway. Uh, I'm the host for this evening and co-chair of the 2021-2022 Lecture Committee at the Department of Architecture Textual Science at Ryerson University. I would like to begin, first of all, by welcoming everyone uh, from here in Toronto or elsewhere in the world, uh, um, and I hope uh, you'll enjoy this uh, special lecture this evening. So the just to give you a bit of a background, the theme for this series that we're doing right now is, is called Disruptions, and all of our speakers are, are um, really a, a good match for, for this theme. Uh, and the idea is that the students will be able to uh, take these lectures as a learning opportunity. Uh, and I think really it's not just for students, it's everyone uh, who comes in and sees the lecture. Um, the thinking really is that, especially after COVID, where all of the problems that we've seen emerge or being uncovered as a result of all of the things that came with COVID, uh, it's time to rethink how we are practicing in our, as architects uh, and you know really what our profession is all about. And, and of course, this evening we are here uh, online uh, using Zoom, which is really an opportunity, but also something that is only happening because of COVID. So and it's really becoming a, um, a, a profound transformational time. Okay, so uh, I guess I should also thank our sponsors, uh, the Ontario Association of Architects and the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada have kindly supported us. Uh, and I would also like to uh, acknowledge where we are. Uh, so of course we are in Toronto, but uh, the um, what Toronto uh, used to be, I guess, is also quite important. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge the land that we're standing on. So Ryerson sits on lands that are now known as Toronto, which are inhabited for millennia by many Indigenous nations and people. Uh, it is our tradition to begin our meetings with the land acknowledgement, which not only recognizes the enduring presence and resilience of Indigenous peoples in our area, but is also a reminder that we are all accountable to these relationships. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. Uh, the Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the uh, Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee uh, that bound them to share the territory and to protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. And it is in this spirit and on behalf of our university that I welcome you all to Ryerson and our department and on behalf of the felt, uh, excuse me, on the behalf of the faculty, I welcome you. So I would like to uh, hand things over to Terry Peters, uh, the uh, co-chair for the lecture series. Thanks, Will. Uh, again, welcome everyone. My name is Terry Peters. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Architectural Science and co-chair of the committee, the lecture committee this year, along with Will Galloway. So tonight's lecture is by Arandi De Silva, an esteemed architect and editor. And the title of her talk is Centering the Edge, Interrupting Architectural Narratives. Before we introduce the speaker, I'd like to give a brief outline of tonight's event. So Arandi is going to uh, give her lecture for uh, just around an under an hour, and then we'll have some questions at the end. So while you're watching the lecture in the audience, please think of questions or comments that you'd like to make, and I'd ask you to enter them into the chat function of Zoom. Uh, so we have the Q&A there, that's where you should enter your uh, questions. And then we'll get to those after Arandi's lecture. So uh, after her talk, I will turn the podium over to one of our student committee members, uh, Sadberg Augma, and we will uh, field the questions from the audience. And now I'll ask one of our student committee members, Kira Phillips, to introduce uh, this evening's speaker. Hi, everyone. So on behalf of the students, faculty, and staff here at the Department of Architectural Science, it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker. Uh, Arandi De Silva is a Sri Lankan, British, Canadian architect and editor, currently based in Accra, Ghana. Arandi has given lectures at the University of Rwanda and has also worked in architectural offices, including the likes of OMA. Uh, she was a project editor on Friden's 20th Century World Architecture book, which explores modern and postmodern architecture beyond the Western world. And she also edited BI's 2014 publication, Free Architecture on the Loose, uh, a comprehensive exploration of the concept of freedom in architecture. 
In 2016, Arandi launched Loke Journal, which examines the art of making as an inclusive, cross-cultural, and global pursuit. Loke Journal is a leader in the effort to actively widen the conversations in the field by making space for a multiplicity of experiences, ideas, and work. So we thank you, Arandi, for joining us today, and it is an honor to welcome you to the DAS community. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and thank you to the department and its faculty and students for your invitation and the opportunity to join such a fantastic group of speakers in this series. It's inspiring to see where you have collectively decided to place the focus this year. Tonight's talk is called, as, as was mentioned, Centering the Edge, Interrupting Architectural Narratives. I'm going to begin with a quote from Peggy McIntosh, who earned her PhD at Harvard and is a feminist and anti-racism activist who pioneered putting the dimension of privilege into America's, into American discussions of power, gender, class, and sexuality. The quote reads, I think one's own individual experience is sacred. Testifying to it is very important but so is seeing that it is set within a framework outside of one's personal experience that is much bigger and has repetitive statistical patterns in it. It is through the, the lens of personal experience contextualized within the larger system that I will speak to you today. This evening, I will be discussing writing as a tool for change, how personal accounts and essays can start to push the architectural discipline toward a more equitable space. This talk will examine how the act of filling the gaps and what stories are shared can move the discipline toward greater understanding. I will discuss the role that writing can play in building a ground up movement toward a freer landscape while looking back at over a decade of inclusive digital and printed work. I'm going to begin by introducing you to a few independent publications that I've made discussing how these projects work to open up architectural conversations and to also build supportive and inspiring community. From there, we will move to what you can do as students to expand your engagement with writing. A question that I often ask myself is, when working with the dominant architectural paradigm and being subject to its limits, how can one begin to challenge these limits in order to enable progress? An early attempt to respond to this came with a project called BI. BI was an independent publishing project that originated the two column architectural writing format, exploring one topic with two points of view. The project was a collaboration with my good friend, the architect, Ishan Bailey. Our conversations about Bai began online in July of 2009 between London and New York City. Sean had recently graduated from Yale and was freelancing in Manhattan at the time. I had just graduated from the Architectural Association and I proposed that we start a writing project. We organically pursued a conceptual format that grew from our, from our collaboration as a pair of writers navigating different contexts and landed on the two column format pretty quickly. As we had graduated into a recession and had attended schools that were barely within our reach financially, money was tight during this time. As it is not uncommon for marginalized individuals, gaining mentorship was a challenge that we never quite met, in part because we are not seen as embodying the potential to be important contributors to the architectural discourse. Keep in mind, this is 2009, so the landscape of things were a little bit different than they are today. With these barriers, it took us a bit of time to figure things out. On February 14th of 2010 from Rotterdam and New York City, we launched with an early experimental foray into exploring design theory on the internet, innovating, innovatively offering short architectural observations, analysis, opinions, anecdotes, and history. 
The fundamental purpose of Bai was to build an alternative space with some distance from architectures, established institutional systems, outlooks, and approaches. As editors who are underrepresented individuals in the larger field, we sought to explore themes that are not only, that are not generally prioritized, but nevertheless are important to engage, thereby making room for content that is often overlooked or actively erased. In late 2013, we released Free Architecture on the Loose, which paired short extemporaneous texts with longer studied pieces. This volume presents a wide view on the notion of free, bringing together a multitude of perspectives drawn from within and beyond the discipline that together explore the term's implications for architecture. In free, we were graced with the presence of some of our favorite thinkers, writers, curators, editors, and architects, which include Keller Easterling, Keoka Ota, Schumann Bassar, and many more. Here is one of the shorter pieces that we included, um, which is a kind of meditation on artists Christophe Bouchel's Piccadilly Community Center, which was um, exhibited at Hauser and Worth in London. And here is the sort of first page after the title page uh, from a piece called To Be Adventurous on Free Love in Architecture in the 1960s, which looks at um, the swinging counterculture counter lifestyles of Manhattan architects. John and Mimi Lobel in the 60s who had met studying under Louis Kahn at UPenn. This one is written by uh, Jack Murphy. Here's an image from Jill, Desmi Jill Desimini's piece, uh, Take Me, I'm Yours, Reclaiming Free Space in the City. She's a associate professor of landscape architecture at Harvard who contributed this article, which looks at adopting land in Detroit. And then here's an image from architect Andreas Angelidakis's My Own Private Utopia. So Bai marked an important period of incubating ideas and approaches leading to what I'm currently working on now, which is Loke Journal, an independent publication that presents inclusive, cross-cultural and global perspectives on design. So we'll come to that in a few moments. With Bai, we were primarily inspired by our desire to write but also architecture's lack of representation, the gap in architectural writing and publishing. It was important for us to grant ourselves the agency to communicate in this space. For Sean and I, being queer and non-binary and a woman of color respectively, it didn't seem likely that this would be provided to us from institutions. So we went ahead and we built a space for ourselves. In the architecture worlds that we know, there's an emphasis on top-down messaging rather than an emphasis on dialogue and valuing ideas sourced from a spectrum of engagement. We're interested in building something a bit more grounded and conversational in a sense. We worked with writers who are at different stages of their careers, and it was important to us to present individuals with some equivalency, even temporarily. We considered the buy format to be an infrastructure that writers could plug into. So in this way, the project was built with an openness that individuals could really bring themselves to. In the period of making buy, I was experiencing the significant and unexpected pressures of structural oppression that exists within and around Western architecture systems and institutions. I say 
unexpected because the message from within the community is often that people in this space are too smart and conscious to be perpetrators of such practices. But unfortunately, this is not true. So this is a quote from um, a couple issues ago uh, from Anya Aronofsky Kronberg, who is the founder of Vestoy, which is a journal that looks, it's, a, it's fashion's critical thinking journal. And we were discussing their current issue at the time, which was an issue on masculinity. And um, this was one of the things that she said in our interview. On one hand, it's unsurprising that we as humans privilege others who are like us. We want people around us to confirm who we are. It can easily become a closed loop. Within a short period of launching by, several writing projects bearing resemblance to ours made their appearances. Two such examples were brought forward by academic institutions. With their lack of synthesis of our format and concept, these projects were uncomfortably similar to ours. What these groups could not recognize was the essential mission and value of our project as a progressive space for architectural conversation built from the ground up by individuals whose marginalized experiences hold the potential to widen the scope of critical thinking. These organizations diluted our work and purpose and in laying claim to what we made, they also erased our contributions to their journey, to their journeys. Witnessing what happened to Bai just as we were starting out provided some early insights into some of the ways in which systemic oppression is perpetuated within the architectural discipline. Following this experience and other related ones, it became important to take a deliberate step away from this space and to disengage from architecture's dominant priorities and systems and move into a space that is even more open and flexible than Bai was. So here's a quote from the African-American author, uh, James Baldwin, somebody who lived internationally in Turkey and in France and various places. Um, it reads, when you're writing, you're trying to find out something which you do not know. So what came next following by is Loke which is a celebration of a design world that lies beyond limited ways of thinking and doing. It responds to the lack of criticality that can stem from some of architecture's unfounded beliefs. An important aspect of the reorientation that followed by has been shifting the content toward an audience that is authentically conscious of issues around equity. They are a significant and inspiring part of the work that we do. Loke predominantly features the writing of practicing architects. It explores production narratives and architecture, but also in adjacent cultural fields through a spatial perspective to potentially gain new insights and enable an interchange of ideas. This project folds together many related themes that manifest in the landscape of production. Globalism, cross-cultural narratives, various migration narratives, and so on. These are themes that aren't deeply explored in typical design press. The current issue is on the theme, is on the topic of understanding, which we view both from its educational and emotional dimensions. Um, so exploring ideas like learning, comprehension, discernment, and even empathy. So we'll take a quick look through a selection from the publication. Um, here we have a piece on Andres Studer's Abitat Marocan in Casablanca, which is written by 
Rice Design Alliance editor and a long-term collaborator, Jack Murphy. This piece looks at how architects can anticipate customization and renovation from their users and design for it, but it also touches on the complicated relationship between progressive form and regressive social structures like colonization. Here are the satellite dishes that are referenced in the initial slide. They came with the customization. A short poetic piece um, here called Small Wall by Toronto architect, which some of you may know, Anne-Marie Armstrong. Um, this one is about returning home to Barbados and observing vernacular ways of making. Essentially, this piece is about negotiation. The wall is a process version of the natural landscape that it sits in. In this piece, art historian Emily Paskovics looks at the environmentally symbiotic pre-colonial Incan foundations that Cusco, Peru is built on to this day. Here's another piece from Jack uh, on how the Mexican, actually this one was originally written for Bai, but we, it was, it was a really great piece and I wanted to kind of revisit it. So we sort of updated it for um, this issue, for this topic. Um, it's on how the Mexican architect Louis Berrigan's bedroom and international record collection mirror one another's interiority. This is someone I've known from my school days. We, we first started practicing, we, we established actually a practice together. So this is my first business partner. This is London architect and urban designer, Stephanie Edwards, who takes us through London's West Indian markets as spaces of cultural exchange. This is architect Corbin Keach, so another another individual who's been contributing since the by days. He unpacks Sitio Burl Marx as a space cultivating mutually beneficial diversity in Brazil. This is a piece on active social architecture who are a Kigali Rwanda based office doing really interesting work. Uh, they emphasize community engagement and they enable local women to participate in construction. Um, their practice is very much focused around building skills in the local community and ensuring that the community sort of is invested in the architecture that is um, built and so that they can kind of maintain it and uh, make the most of it as the years go on. Some really great site images. All the materials are local materials, so they don't import anything for their work. The bricks are made locally. This piece is uh, on the French architect Jean Prouvé's Maison Tropicale which came into Africa, specifically to Congo and Niger, uh, on a plane and left the same way. It was, a, it was part of a kind of French colonial campaign. An interview with Columbia University professor and director of their advanced architecture design program, Andre Haquet who explores intersectionality in architecture, amongst other things he questions how we can begin to include the environment in the concept of inclusion, which I think is really important. Alongside these architectural pieces, we look at related design content that can begin to converse with this architectural content. Um, a couple of examples um, here are this one is an article on the artist Chris Shank, whose medium is mainly 
his or his format rather is mainly furniture, uh, some I would guess a kind of product design. Um, he works in Detroit's Bangla town, so the Bangladeshi neighborhood. His work engages the local art community and embraces its Bangladeshi neighbors, many of whom work in his practice. Uh, the article touches on how some of these Bangladeshi ladies bring their skills and quality control from Bangladeshi factories to Chris's production process, which I think is really interesting. I think a lot of the people also that feature who are not architects and also a lot of the architects or projects that are kind of um, engaged more specifically with architecture. I think, I think there's just a lot of very independent thinkers, um, people who are sort of pursuing kind of things very much on their own. Uh, this piece is on Oseduro, who are a duo um, working in Ghana, Marianne and Molly. It examines textile production in West Africa, specifically in a Ghanaian context, uh, along with the rewards and challenges that it presents. We discuss how producing in Ghana compares to Asian textile and garment production which dominates the industry and also considers how this local industry can carry on sustainably. There's a lot of uh, content also um, in some of these articles about ethical production. So the subtitle for Loke is the Journal of Making. It was important to claim making on behalf of a larger group of people representing a wider pool of experiences. I'm interested in process and production and regard both as very dynamic, but also grounded entry points into design conversations that can explore in many directions and uncover very complicated realities. It is a launching point for how production, culture, history, and economics intersect with making space. Here's a quote from Arundhati Roy, who studied architecture and then chose a career in writing. She is known as one of India's foremost public intellectuals. The quote reads, writing is not about satisfying everybody. It is your own inquiry that you have to follow. For me, this project is about presenting a bigger picture of design. And to do that, it was important to look globally. Loke challenges the ideas and concepts that form the hegemonic Western design consciousness that come from outside of what it deems valuable while destabilizing the sense that it is all knowing or working alone toward progress. As I had previously mentioned, Loke predominantly features the writing of practicing architects. While Loke's subject matter reaches beyond architecture's frame, architects are consistently in the picture because it is important for the project to have an architectural vision at its core. Unconstrained by disciplinary limits, the content becomes flexible and can lean into socially progressive design topics that perhaps haven't been given much of a place in strictly architectural conversations. It also contextualizes architectural production in a larger system of international design production, providing a bigger picture view. I think the interviews and essays offer designers some feedback and support in relation to important questions like how to set up and develop a business or where to draw boundaries and insights on how others approach designing ethically. Through my past experiences and my current project, which involves engaging with people with different backgrounds, it's clear that there are large gaps in what stories are told and there is interest in the ones that are not often heard. In general, it is important for people with different experiences to get involved in sharing their perspectives. 
there is value in the difference. Without different voices, you inevitably have gaps in understanding, which to me goes against much of the point of academia that is fundament that fundamentally exists to enable understanding. Initially, the locate journey was catalyzed by my early experiences in architecture that showed me the active ways in which the discipline limits itself. Launching the journal was a way to step outside of architecture's dominant landscape and into design spaces which are more able to recognize, accommodate, and respect difference. I think with each issue, the project steps a little deeper into its unique path. As we move forward, I hope that we can continue this trajectory as there's so much exciting content to explore here that I think it is adding something new to conversations of space making and production and doing the important work of fortifying and adding depth to design's capacity for criticality. While this work had begun ahead of the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movements, both have been important and energizing reminders of how far architecture has to go. The conversations around equity seem to be inching toward opening up to the actual lived reality with heightened awareness around these issues. I hope that these paradigm shifts that have emerged from the ground up are here to stay and that we can collectively build on them in favor of a more socially progressive architectural landscape. Related to this, I think it's important to quickly touch on the topic of format. Bai was mainly online, but did toggle between digital and print, while Loke was a print only project. With Bai, we wanted to experiment with architectural theory on the internet, something that was new at the time. With the online version of Bai, we worked with the concept of comparing two individuals' perspectives on a single topic as a catalyst for exploring the subject's complexity. With our print publication free, we amplified this approach with more voices meditating on a single topic, which is a format that Loke continues. I believe the themes, the individual voices of the interviewees and the writers come together to guide each issue lending a unique and useful depth to the work. Alongside this, there are other aspects of Bai's formats that are still in use with Loke. Our short meditations on a topic were emphasized, our short meditations on a topic were emphasized by Bai in this space. And it's something that I continue to work with, with in Loke. When others began claiming our work, the openness, the ease of access of the internet became an uncomfortable space wherein to exist. Maybe when the moment is right, returning online may be an option, but for now, print is where this project will live. So this is a quote from Ambedkar, who is a, a Dalit, which is the a low caste in India. He was born in a village, attended a village school, and through his kind of academic study, he eventually went to study at the London School of Economics and Columbia University. And then he returned to India where he became a statesman um, and he wrote India's constitution um, in the kind of post-colonial period. So the quote reads, an idea needs propagation, propagation, otherwise it will wither and die. With by, sorry. <laughs> One of the important lessons from my early days, both in regards to making by, but also in regards to working in offices, is that acknowledgement in the form of credit, a citation, or a reference is important. In the case of marginalized people, if you don't provide acknowledgement for their contributions, you maintain the status quo. This is a contributor to things continuing unchanged. We go on simply discussing the work of a few. As architects, we need to make space within our profession. If we are to overcome some of the inequities in architecture and beyond, I do think as much as possible, 
it is important to, for people to find ways to work together. Our individual viewpoints are complex. They aren't binary. We don't fall into two categories. An essential feature that is built into bias format is its ability to demonstrate this complexity. Sometimes the writers interpret the topic the same way. Other times they go in two vaguely related directions. And at other moments they are in opposition or sometimes they're expressing some combination of these possible positions. With Loke, the format is less formal, but it demonstrates the same nuanced outcomes. What I've come to understand over the years is that both writing and publication can be tools to help you connect with your interests, develop your design agenda, spread your ideas, and build a community that resonates with who you are. In a talk at the Barbican in London um, around maybe 2010, 2011, Rem Koolha stated that he believed his publications are architecture, meaning that essentially they're united as a practice. The two inform one another. While this statement may initially sound provocative or a little imprecise to some, and while we may not use this idea to the same end, I tend to agree with him because publishing has been a device that I have used to make space. For myself, through these editing experiences, working in different environments and formats, I have gained a lot of useful insight into this space, but I also got to see how gaps in understanding arise as a result of homogeneity. After I graduated from the AA, I went to work very briefly at OMA, where I recall listening to a recording of Rem Kohas speaking with the Japanese metabolist architects as part of his research for his book, Project Japan, Metabolism Talks. Some of the metabolists were speaking about the influence Buddhism had had on their way of thinking, and Rem seemed to express a dismissive attitude toward the idea that Buddhism could play a role in design. It seemed as though it was hard for him to take this idea seriously. As an Asian person who is also from a predominantly Buddhist country, I interpreted the situation as an instance of cultural difference. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that he didn't grasp this dimension of the metabolist outlook He's bringing his personal experience to his work, and that is all any of us can do. The difficulty I have with this scenario is that when you have people with similar experiences more or less consistently dominating, it lessens the likelihood that certain kinds of content might be brought forward into, to an architectural audience. These instances are where dominant culture can potentially deny, invalidate, or erase experiences that exist beyond their knowledge. Following my time at OMA, I moved on to an organization with female leadership and became the project editor of Fiden's 20th Century World Architecture which is part of their Atlas series. Um, so it's those very large books that weigh about eight pounds or something like this. Um, so this book was a book that expands the modern and postmodern canon beyond the established Western scope, presenting a global view of the last century's important works. The project features over 750 works, which were selected in consultation with 150 regional experts, making this a very useful resource for architects. This image is uh, junior, staff, ju junior staff housing uh, built for the government. It's located in Osu. Um, it was built in 1962. All of these buildings that are in this book at the time of publication, which would have been maybe about roughly nine years ago, um, they were all still standing. This one's by J.G. Halstead and D.A. 
Barrett. So few organizations could have pulled off, pulled off what Fiden did here, which speaks to the important role large scale organizations have to play in shifting the conversation. They can leverage resources that few others can. This image is from Uganda, from Mityana. So this is Mityana Pilgrim Center Shrine by Justice Dahinden, which was built in 1988. Some of you may recognize this slide. Um, our team was large and predominantly female, but there was only one other member of the in-house editorial team who was a person of color, visibly speaking. Her experience was instrumental in catching texts that may have come across as demeaning to various non-Western cultures. Given the ambition of this book, not catching this sort of text would have been less than ideal. So this is St. Mary's Church, which was built in 1968 and is in Red Deer, Alberta. It's by Douglas Cardinal Architect. So I'm going to conclude the section on my work and shift now to discussing what you as students can do. I'm going to head this section off with a quote from Denise Scott Brown from her article, an article that everyone um, who studies architecture should read. It's called Room at the Top, Sexism and Architecture Star System. It was written in 1975 but withheld from publication until 1989 because um, it was thought to be simply too scandalous to publish. This article is nearly a half century old. It's 46 years old. And unfortunately, um, there, are, there is a lot of content in this article that is still relevant. So the quote reads, my concern is that also is, is that although school is not free of discrimination, it is probably the least discriminatory environment architects will encounter in their careers. Personally, that is something that um, I agree with. It reflects my reality. It reflected my reality at the time. And for you as students, I think it's really important for you to use your time as students because, I mean, while things are changing, I do think that this, this is a really kind of free, free sort of moment for you where you can take advantage. So the question that I seek to answer is as a student, how can I begin to participate in architectural conversations? You are already participating in architectural conversations. Every essay that you research and write in school is an opportunity to get to know yourself and develop your interests. There are a lot of resources out there for you that you can use to cultivate and advance ideas that lie outside of architecture's usual set of references, but you might have to do a little bit of work to uncover it. Your essays are also tools to transform the landscape because they offer an opportunity to change how you interact with architecture's dominant themes by expanding the scope of the sort of content that you are engaging with and writing about. The reality is that there is low retention of various non-dominant groups in the profession, although that is improving. One example that comes up again and again is that of women. While the individual reasons for people not becoming qualified are complex, in my opinion, I believe that there is a relationship between structural oppression, the abuse that people suffer as a result, and those who eventually find that the architectural profession isn't a space that they can be part of. If we keep maintaining the same limits in architecture, if we only acknowledge the same contributors, this will remain a difficult environment for many of us. As students, if you want to play a role in diminishing the patterns of discrimination, the glass ceilings, the erasure, and so on, expanding your understanding of architecture beyond the status quo is an important step. Consider, dedicate, consider dedicating your essay writing in part or wholly to those with non-dominant identities, to women, to non-Europeans, to the LGBTQ plus community, 
to accessible design, to the environment, and so on. Because academic institutions are foundational, if we can begin to widen conversations at this site, perhaps that awareness can carry over into professional practice. Related to this idea, the internet has destabilized the ability of singular theorists to dominate. This has had several impacts. Conversations don't only have to happen in printed books or at university lecterns, both of which are guarded by gatekeepers. They can happen online and engage anyone who wants to participate. We aren't seeing the realization of iconic publications like Learning from Las Vegas or SML Excel so much these days, and that's a bit of a loss, but things are evolving and there are opportunities for newcomers as a result. As you get informed about architecture, I would advise writing your ideas down based on your own individual interpretation of what you are learning. You don't have to be a follower. It's okay to be critical of what you're reading if you honestly disagree. If you don't already have one at your school, I would suggest starting a student publication, which could be printed or online, or even in the form of an Instagram page. Build a place where you can record your experiences and ideas through a writing practice. I was just speaking to students earlier this week at the University of Houston, and they told me that they produce a, pod, a podcast, which I thought was interesting. Engaging contemporary media fosters community and enables feedback. It is through understanding many experiences or stories, a widened scope of research, that we can collectively start to gain better insight. You won't have insight with an action. So the next question is, as an architect, why is it important to write down your ideas? Reading and writing are tools for enabling impactful design. With every project that you make, you should have a position of some sort. Reading can help you situate yourself within or outside of the existing theoretical landscape. And writing helps you to define what exactly your agenda is. It can bring clarity to your work and it can help to define an identity that is authentic and rooted in your personal experiences but also that contextualizes your experience within the larger system. Writing is a tool that can help one develop a clear vision. So we've reached the end and I'm going to wrap things up with a quote from the visual artist, Nick Cave, who I interviewed for our issue on the body. Here he is with one of his sound suits. Um, I've asked him, I asked him what advice he had for young people, and this is what he had to say. Quote, you have got to pay attention to your life. You have got to be responsible. In other words, whoever you are, you have agency, so be strategic and use it. Great, thank you. That, that was amazing, and what a wonderful quote to finish on. It was quite, a, uh, quite an amazing thing to say. Um, so I, I think we should start asking some questions. Uh, sorry, who, who is? Uh, was it Sadberg who's going to take charge of that? Yeah, Sadberg and I are going to. So I encourage you to, uh, in the audience, please put your questions in the Q and A function um, of Zoom uh, to get the conversation going and to share your questions and comments about the talk. We'll give people a minute to do that. Sadberg, do you wanna, do you have a, a comment or something you've been thinking about asking to start us off? I didn't prepare for that. Okay, no, I mean, there's so much to go into. I just wanted yeah. to give you the opportunity. Um, if there isn't, I don't see a question. Maybe I can 
sneak in a first comment or question here. So thank you so much, Arandi, for this talk. There were so many things that you brought up that I thought could be really great sparks for uh, having a more in-depth conversation. Um, I wondered if you could say something about the idea of production and making and architecture, because I think something that comes up in teaching sustainable design and in teaching architecture that I've really found is this disconnection between the people making things uh, in the architecture and building industry and the people designing things. Um, we can't cover everything in architecture school, but I feel like this is really lacking. You know, this is a major disconnect here. And I bet you have something to say about that. Okay, um, I just wanna let you know that the audio is coming in for me really cut up. I did hear, I did understand your question. Um, can you hear me? Everything's yeah. okay? Yeah, okay. I can hear you. Might be my internet. Uh, sorry about that. It, it's probably mine, I have a feeling. Um, so, I mean, a big part of this project actually was, I mean, I, I believe I mentioned it, was to kind of engage with a lot of things that were missing for me in my architectural education. And, I mean, I think production is just so interesting and, and, and talking to different people in very different kind of... Um, sort of context, I mean, in terms of where they are, but also, you know, in an architectural context, in a fashion context, in an art production context. Um, I mean, I think, I think there is a kind of reality that people um, face when they're producing, which is a little bit different to what is discussed often in schools. I mean, you have a lot of things you need to balance. Um, I think the there there are some kind of very practical things. For example, you know, there's the business aspect. Um, you have to sort of consider the financial side of things. You know, what is viable? What makes sense? What do people want? You are not going to continue to be able to produce things unless there is a buyer. Um, not everything is going to thrive within a capitalist system. So those are things that people really have to balance. I mean, I think for some people, they kind of come into a space and it's it's very quick for them. Um, people sort of latch on to their projects very quickly and they're able to sort of produce in a really kind of ideal context, um, the kind of context that you sort of hear about in school, you know, you sort of graduate, you start your business or you start your design enterprise and you just have jobs and they keep coming in and there's no kind of gap. But for other people, you know, it can take about a decade um, to figure out how to make their project profitable. Um, and, you know, it's a lot of trial and error and they are kind of treading water, doing other things while they kind of figure out how to make their project viable. And, you know, I've spoken to people where something as simple as not working with retailers and just doing a direct to customer model has basically made their business thrive. Um, there are really interesting things that come up with kind of the people who work more with in the clothing industry um, that I think can be reflected in architecture. Um, although I don't, I can't say I've necessarily had a conversation with somebody about that, but certain trends, you know, that people want to hear about. So people who've been in the industry for a long time have told me, like, let's say over a decade have said, you know, initially when I started in the industry, um, there was really an emphasis on kind of people who are different colors being models for our clothing. Um, but nowadays there's a more of an emphasis or the emphasis, it, th there's that, but also people want different sizes. But then how do you balance that at times if you don't have a customer that's a different size? You know, if your customer just isn't there and you're producing something for a certain size. So, I mean, I kind of think those things are are interesting. 
trying to think of some architectural examples. Um, yeah, we can come back to it. We have a few questions come in. If 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 yeah, there's good. time, we could reflect on on that relationship. Sure. Um, so we have someone asking if you could speak to the relationship between access to money and the size of vision. Uh, and in specific, um, they're saying this is a huge problem in the media and also for BIPOC creators and this idea of um, self-censoring based off of what they think is possible as opposed to dreaming for those that are less oppressed. Um. Sorry, can you just say the first part? You said the financial aspect of... Yeah, so between access to uh, money and the size of vision. So if um, so, they're just asking about um, how one self-censors based off of what they think is possible with the stuff that they have access to. So. Well, I mean, our project, we started with just a couple hundred dollars. I mean, it wasn't a huge amount of money. So... I think that project went pretty far. Um, I think you need to kind of work with the budget that you have and try to kind of maximize it. Um, I mean, and I think working online can be great in that aspect. I do think, I mean, it's difficult because I do think, I understand this comment about self-censoring. Um, I mean, I don't really know what to say in regard to that because I think, I mean, I think again, I mean, with a lot of projects, you know, if you exist within a certain dominant community and those are the individuals who are going to push your project forward, I mean, you kind of do need to find a way to appeal to that somehow. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that that's what you should do, but I mean, I think that's that kind of practical aspect where it does need to kind of engage, but I mean, I also, you know, I think you should be experimental and try things, but, or find an audience, you know, another thing that people tell me um, is, you know, niche, niche things are very kind of desirable these days. Uh, so, I mean, if you can find your niche, I think that also works really well. I mean, I know a lot of people personally who are, South Asian diaspora who kind of produce projects in cities like Manhattan um, and they've managed to find their niche. Um, you know, it's not something you necessarily would have launched 10, 15, 20 years ago, I don't think. Um, but, you know, with Instagram and things like this, with these kind of platforms, social media, I think you can you can find your, your niche. Um, I mean, it is a balance, you know, and I think, I do think you have to decide for yourself where you want to sit or where you want to make compromises. If you want to make compromises, if you don't want to make compromises, you know, how will you navigate things? Um, I think those are all personal decisions. I think the next question picks up on the comment that you made earlier about um, including the environment as part of inclus in inclusivity. Uh, the question is, what is architecture's responsibility to marginalize people who are most impacted by climate change and what can be done? Um, well, that's a huge question. That's a huge I one. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that. But I mean, I do think, you know, for Western architecture institutions, um, I think it's important to address climate change because it is kind of the production that has happened in industrialized countries that is accelerating climate change around the world. And it's interesting to see um, the sort of climate change denial that's happening in Western countries or the kind of lack of kind of government intervention in terms of um, implementing regulation. Um, and then to contrast that with conversations 
I've had with people who've grown up in villages in places like Rwanda, in Sri Lanka, in Ghana. I mean, everyone in these countries, for the most part, are very aware that climate change is real because they know the temperature has changed. For farmers, they know that the rains are not coming on, on time. Um, these are usually things that people can anticipate very accurately. They know when to plant, they know when it's time to harvest, and these things are completely thrown off kilter. Um, so that, that kind of understanding is very different, I think. Um, I haven't heard any climate denial from, from anyone I've met in this part of the world. So I do think architecture institutions um, they need to they need to sort of have conversations and prepare students and really take a strong stance because i do think if governments are not doing that i mean maybe you know academic institutions can step up um, and use kind of facts based information to to build a profession that is more conscious and able to deal with this crisis that we're in. Thank you. Um, so one of our professors, uh, George Capellos, he uh, is saying thank you for your thoughtful presentation in the Q&A. Uh, he is also asking, um, well, he's expressing that he's interested in your decision to publish and engage in print media, which uh, in the current realm of digital com communications may not allow you to reach as broad of an audience um, as you may have with digital means. Um, and uh, he's asking, uh, many students turn first to digital before seeking out print. Uh, can you comment on this and your own encouragement that students write? Um. So, sorry, the question is? Um, just the, the question is, um, sorry, I'm just, there's a whole paragraph that I'm just trying to reword to be a little bit more shorter, I guess. But um, in the current realm of digital communications, um, a lot of students turn first, um, including myself, to um, digital print before seeking out um, like actual print. So. Um, could you, I guess, comment on this relationship and your own encouragement that students write? Sure. So, I mean, I think digital print is great because it's accessible, um, which I think is nice. Like, you literally don't need a budget. I mean, we're talking about budgets. You can start an Instagram page and you can monetize that. I mean, so I think this is kind of really the value of digital in many ways, but also, you know, the kind of the directness is amazing. The um, the audience that you can reach very quickly is amazing. I mean, there's a lot of kind of upsides to print, but then what we found with buy is what's also amazing is how quickly people can appropriate your work, and which was not something we expected at all, and not from the kind of demographics that we were expecting, which is yeah, I mean, we basically kind of um, enabled sort of individuals that maybe we are not so kind of aligned with in terms of our thinking. So that was a little bit surprising. So I think appropriation can happen very quickly with digital um, and, and that can create, that can lead to problems. Um, where you won't be able to kind of promote your work or take ownership of your work as a result. So the flip side of that is print. And I mean, print is really kind of having a moment, um, even though maybe it doesn't seem that way in terms of kind of specialized publications. So you have a lot of kind of independent magazine shops and very specialized publications um, showing up. Um, and there's a, a great deal of interest in things like that. You see magazines that are about just tennis or about, um, 
yeah, critical thinking and fashion. I mean, I feel like that would have more of an audience, but you know, this kind of uh, basketball through a kind of really sort of contemporary lens. Um, so you have these kind of specialized things. I mean, I think print is nice too, because it's an object. I mean, some of, like OMA's books are very much about the object. That large scale fight in book is very much about its objectness. So there is something nice in these publications where you have something you can hold in your hands, where it has a kind of design capacity that you don't have with digital. I mean, I did an interview with um, two people who own a really great magazine shop in Manhattan called Import News, which has all these kind of global publications. And um, one of the owners had said, Ken, he'd said, uh, you know, I've never seen a, um, a website that made me excited, you know? So I think that's kind of the counterpoint, whereas, you know, you certainly see kind of graphic design projects and things like this that are exciting. Um, things also seem like they might have a bit more value when they're tangible, um, whereas when they're online, they somehow just become part of this kind of stream, you know, this endless stream and people just want more and more and more and more and more, like you can't control it. I mean, we were publishing by a number of times each week, you know, and it's just kind of like this sort of enterprise where you just have to kind of keep producing all the time. So I think you have a bit more control with print, um, you know, it comes in waves. So I think that's quite nice. Um, does that cover it or was there something? Yeah. About no, um, and as I've uh, reworded, I did miss a point um, that George wanted me to reiterate, but um, he was also kind of agreeing with you in the sense that digital may be less permanent than print also. Um, yeah. Something to consider as well. I mean, I think it's, it's, it is permanent. Like, it seems like it doesn't go away when you kind of, uh, you know, put something there. But I mean, I guess it just seems like there's this kind of, this sort of, you know, constant supply of information. I mean, I do think of like the Instagram feed or some kind of social media feed as a similar sort of like, you know, a different scale, but this constant, you know, kind of like updating, 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 where you're you're just getting all of this information and there's nothing kind of rarefied or special. And I mean, there's only so much you can invest, I think, as well when when you have to produce so much, you know. So I mean, I think that's where these things can start to differ. I think when we produced by, by free when we produce free the book i mean you know there was something to that it's like where it's joining a kind of um you know a sort of history of publication let's say it's it's part of something whereas like you know i don't know how you kind of present things that are digital i mean i don't i haven't really seen that in architecture how you present kind of online online kind of architectural writing um so it kind of comes back to that idea of the web page just not being that interesting and being a bit limited you know with with print you just have all these variables the paper choices the ink color black and white um there's just a lot more to kind of work with um the next question comes from um uh, Paul Cocker, he says, I'm a Ryerson graduate from 1970 in engineering technology structural. I took interviews to continue with architecture at U of T, but decided not to pursue. I always had an interest in understanding of design. I owned and ran a construction company and always had a feel for what the architect was trying to accomplish and found ways to get it done within budget. To the point made earlier, I encourage architecture students to understand and respect the production side. They can be great partners. I think that's an important uh, Point. Yeah, absolutely. They need to be partners, like in reality. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm gonna ask the next no. one. 
Um, so our next question is architecture, like all expensive creations, movies, etc., is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, what tricks and or rituals do you use to maintain your vision and energy? Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, you do have to take care of yourself. I do think that is something in architecture that is not encouraged. I mean, I feel like that's shifting now, but I think um, certainly when I was in school, it was not encouraged. You know, work is your priority, producing as much as possible. And then in the office environment, it's the same thing. And I think for me, it's been really important to step away from that world and to see how other people outside of the architecture profession you know, manage their businesses, how they produce, how they kind of, you know, kind of keep it together um, using different approaches. Um, I remember a couple of years ago going to a naturopath in Toronto and she, she asked me, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm an architect. And she was, she looked really horrified. And she said, oh, gosh, I get so many architects uh, coming in to see me. And, you know, they are just living these terrible lifestyles. <laughs> um, you know, she's, so, so there's this kind of, I guess there's a reputation, I mean, beyond with people who kind of are dealing with architects. Um, but I mean, I think, I think it's important to not participate, to be honest. Um, I just don't think it's sustainable. I don't think it's healthy. I don't think you can stay on that path. And I just, I just don't think you, it's, I think what you are contributing will reflect, you know, that lifestyle in one way or another. Um, so I do think it's important to guard against it. So yeah. personally, personally, I mean, I, I just kind of um, try to spend time doing things that aren't architecture. Um, I think that's important. And to kind of remember that, you know, the things that the sort of Western architecture world preaches, like that is very much in a kind of contained, that's a contained reality. Um, and it doesn't need to be sort of how everybody lives. Yeah, I definitely agree that the architecture <laughs> lifestyle in that way is not sustainable. I feel like a lot of people even like see that in school, but to hear about it also being a thing in the office space is not very surprising. <laughs> um, the next question is, um, how has the architectural space in regards to the shapes and forms in Kigali and Accra shaped your work with Loki? Um, I mean, I think, I think it's important to be in different spaces to kind of, you know, expand perspective. It's interesting to see how people in different places kind of manage construction, what sort of kind of materials are available. Um, I mean, the kind of, the whole sort of system, you know, like, I mean, in a lot of sort of lower income countries, unfortunately, you get poor quality materials and oftentimes it can be expensive and you have people investing a lot of money um, in kind of building things using these materials. And I mean, it's a difficult thing. And then you have kind of vernacular architecture, which has been really kind of rejected and cast aside, but which is, you know, often very sustainable, um, very appropriate for the climate, um, for the place but is not kind of prioritized. Um, I mean, how does it influence what I'm doing? I think it's really interesting to kind of engage with people and hear their stories and, 
and see, you know, how how people are seeing things, you know, how, how, what are people's priorities and, you know, how are they different and what are we missing in a kind of Western landscape, all these things we kind of take for granted. Um, or also, you know, how, how are kind of people more sort of spiritually fulfilled? I mean, we're talking about this kind of architectural lifestyle, you know, people working, these long hours, you know, I mean, in many parts of the world, people just won't accept that, um, you know, they family is a priority, other things are priorities uh, in, in um, sort of kind of engaging in spiritual practices and things like this are really important to people. Um, work is kind of not something that's all consuming and you just don't have the kind of infrastructure that enables people, you know, social infrastructure, whatever it is to, to just, you know, be kind of. Is your screen frozen, a sad work? Yes, I think. Uh, okay, we'll wait and see if. Yeah. We were just, we weren't sure what to do. So we were like, we'll wrap up the, the talk, but we do have a couple of minutes. Do you do you have time to answer the last two questions? Yeah, Is that absolutely, absolutely. Sorry about that. The internet just like completely <laughs> went flat over here. <laughs> I can't remember who who's doing it. Sadberg, do you I can I can okay. do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have one of our students saying, "Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Uh, usually, endeavors such as what you've been taking on are also personal projects for one to discover and explore narratives that can help heal, liberate, and decolonize ways of thinking we formed in our past. So, since 2016 slash um, the launch of Locate, how has this journey been for you on a personal level? Um, they're just curious to hear how looking into all of these themes of liberation and sharing them publicly have in return impacted you. Yeah, I mean, it's been really interesting, actually. That's a great question. Um, so I think initially when I started, I mean, you know, like I mentioned in the talk, it was pre-Me Too, it was pre-BLM. Um, so I think the kind of interest in these topics I mean, people were, I mean, it depended on the individual, but I think a lot of people were very reluctant to engage, especially people um, who were older and more established. I think, you know, I really kind of had to, you know, sneak a question in here or there. And um, I think it was more younger people, um, women, you know, sort of, people who are not part of kind of the dominant group who who were the ones who are more comfortable, I think, with, with the sort of like path of this project. Um, I mean, I think I gravitate towards people for the most part who, who sort of have these interests to begin with. But, you know, once in a while, I think there are some some people who maybe it's not kind of something they're so comfortable talking about, or it's not something that they're thinking about, even though their work is kind of really amazing. But I think, you know, the last issue did come out just before COVID began. Um, so I haven't made one since COVID began. Um, and so BLM happened kind of, you know, in the months following that. And I mean, I think it's been kind of amazing actually, because, you know, suddenly now so many people are much more open to kind of have these conversations to, you know, sort of state openly where they stand around certain issues. Um, so I think, I think the next issue is going to be interesting because for, for a whole series of reasons, I mean, I think BLM and Me Too have also kind of, you know, confirmed some kind of experiences and ideas that I've had, you know, where I can see them, you know, situated in a larger kind of structural system. Um, 
so I mean, I think that's all been really useful for this publication. Um, and I think the experience of kind of, you know, speaking to different people, being in different places, I mean, I think it's also kind of brought me closer to what my personal interests are. Um, and I think, you know, in the time in the projects leading up to that, you know, I think I kind of had a sense of what those things are. But, you know, I think with with academia, I mean, I think with, you know, since all of these things have happened, I've also been having a lot of conversations with friends of mine that I went to architecture school with, um, you know, I mean, and with Sean, um, who I've known for a long time, and we've kind of been talking about, you know, how different, how like in what a different place we are compared to when we were kind of in school, because, you know, we were kind of being sort of, um, this is not a comment on all academic institutions, but in, in the institutions that we were in, we, you know, there are very kind of specific agendas that were um, pushed forward, you know, and there were very specific kind of boundaries around what was kind of valued. So for me at the Architectural Association, it was very much about a kind of digital um, sort of production, everything kind of had to look a certain way, um, you know, and that was kind of an important sort of starting point for a project. Um, and I mean, I think, I think, you know, now it's like, I don't think any of us are really making that kind of architecture really. I mean, I don't, I can't think of anyone that I went to school with that is producing work in that vein, um, which I think is interesting. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I think, I think it's been, this whole project has been really great um, in terms of sort of, moving me towards a kind of community. I mean, I talked a lot about community. I mean, all the experiences have done that, but, you know, this project has been really good in terms of putting me in touch with individuals um, whose ideas kind of resonate for me. And that's been really, really great and interesting. And I think what we kind of should all be pursuing, you know, in our own ways. Thank you for your our last question um, is from an earlier, uh, related to an earlier question, the one that asked about what kind of, uh, about, about uh, architecture being a marathon and not a sprint and what kind of things you do to, to keep yourself creative and energized. And this person is following up saying that they have been in the movie industry and they've also uh, worked with young architects on their first commissions. Um, and they say, I see both movie making and architecture as fundamentally, fundamentally collaborative arts. Mm. Uh, what is your best learnings on how to bring people along with your journey and vision where the sum is greater than the individual parts? Yeah, uh, that is a good question. Um, I mean, I think architecture has some work to do on kind of acknowledging that it is not a kind of individual activity and that it is more of a collaborative activity. And I mean, I think, I think with this publication, I do aim to show that. I mean, it is again a process. You know, it's not, um, it's not always possible, especially with architects. I mean, it's interesting because I do speak to so many different kinds of makers, but with architects, they're always the people that are the most rushed, that have the least amount of time. <laughs> you know, that can engage the least. Um, with with things like this. I mean, I'm also not the New York Times, so like the amount of kind of press and how far your kind of, you know, reach is gonna be um, investing in something like this is not, you know, I mean, I guess that's something people have to balance, especially when they don't have a lot of time. So, I mean, but it is something that I am trying to do with this publication is to kind of demonstrate that it is collaborative. Um, and emphasize that more. So, so I mean, I think I feel like I'm doing something in that respect, and also engaging with people who, who believe that it is collaborative. You know, who are not, who not, who are not sort of seeing themselves as a kind of, um, kind of individual that sort of you know, that everything sort of revolves around them. Um, I am sort of. 
engage with people who really who who really do believe that architecture is collaborative. So I mean I think I think that's useful and to kind of push those push those individuals and push those stories is useful. Okay, that's a good that's a good uh, note to end on there about community and collaboration. Um, so this time, now that you're here, we can thank you properly <laughs> for your lecture tonight. Yeah, I got some practice in about 10 minutes ago, so this is going to be a very good thank you. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Randy, on behalf of the student body, faculty, and staff community at the Department of Architectural Science. Um, thank you for sharing your work with us. Um, your words this evening have left us um, with a greater understanding of local design on a global scale and also a desire to challenge limits and participate in architectural conversations in order to enable progress. Um, it is really crucial that we have these conversations around the role that architecture has in the interdisciplinary and cross-cultural pursuit of global design and also the importance of writing in the move towards a freer and more inclusive discipline. So thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. Great questions and thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, I, I'll, I suppose I will um, continue also where, where actually where you just came back actually I was going to say uh, thanks to everybody and, and wrap things up. So uh, uh, again, th thank you so much. Uh, Randy, for joining us this evening. It's really, really uh, thought provoking and definitely very interesting. And I'm really glad that you could join us, especially with the time difference uh, between where we are and where you are. Uh, so, on, on behalf of the Department of Architecture Science, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, actually, to thank all of you for joining and, and staying in spite of a few technical glitches. It's really amazing. Uh, speaking of technical glitches, uh, and this is not uh, their fault, but also thank you to the uh, Department of Architectural Science staff, including the two technicians, Michael and Leo, who, who helped us to set this up, uh, and to Alexandra Sonau, who, who also has uh, been working very hard behind the scenes. Uh, also, and I'd like to thank the student members of our committee for their enthusiasm and planning today's lecture. Uh, I think um, it, it definitely helped uh, to have their input for this series. Uh, and then I'd like to finish uh, simply by saying that this is actually our, our last lecture. And so it was great to have Wendy uh, to have us uh, filling this, this last lecture for the year. It's a good um, uh, theme and, and an amazing subject matter to um, leave the year with. And, and I would invite you all to come uh, next year when we begin uh, afresh uh, after the holidays. So thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye.